Cancer challenges every man and woman. It is a test of our civilization's ability to organize for health and happiness. We must meet this disease with the resolution, I choose to live and to help others to live. There has been a worldwide effort to find a cure for cancer, but it still remains medicine's greatest unsolved problem. We currently have a large array of treatments for cancer, but it seems like the more we find out about the disease, the more challenging it is to cure. But there has been many high points in the history of cancer treatments, and I hope to demonstrate just how far we've come in this video, by going from the cancer treatments during Asia times to the more sophisticated ones we have today. Like I mentioned in part 1, we've known about cancer since the beginning of human civilization, and Asia Egyptians wrote in depth about tumours affecting places like the breast, uterus or neck. They mainly recommended the removal of tumours by either surgical excision, or by burning them away using fire drills. But surgery was quite limited at the time, and they had no way to reach tumours that formed deep inside the body, and the tumours that they could reach mostly relapsed after a while. The difficulty of treating cancer was summarised by the Edwin Smith Papyrus, which concludes its section on the disease by simply saying, there is no cure. The ancient Greeks tried a more stepwise approach to treating cancer. Hippocrates was able to distinguish between benign tumours that remain dormant and malignant tumours that grow and can cause death. He advised that you should first treat benign tumours by diet, exercise and rest, and then consider using laxatives to achieve a balance in the four humours. Surgery was a last resort treatment and to only be attempted if the tumour became malignant. But malignant cancer was still almost 100% fatal, and many doctors after Hippocrates had no reliable way of treating it. We need to go all the way to the 19th century for any improvements in the treatment of cancer, and two advancements in the field of surgery was responsible for this. Anesthesia became more advanced, so surgeons could cut deeper into the body, and the antiseptic technique was developed by Joseph Lister in 1865, so there was a lower risk of infection during surgery. The new movement in cancer surgery was led by the American William Halstead. It was common knowledge at the time that cancer first develops locally before spreading to other parts of the body, so a reason that to reduce the chance of relapse you should not only just surgically remove the tumour, but also the entire area surrounding it. He specialised in breast cancer and performed radical mastectomies, where he removed the tumour, the underlying pectoral muscles and nearby lymph nodes in the armpit and the chest. Halstead's patients had a 5-year survival rate of 40%, which was double that of untreated patients and he inspired many surgeons to do radical cancer surgeries on other parts of the body. But the radical surgery was by no means a cure, and it only seemed to delay the inevitable recurrence of the cancer and eventual death of the patients. Radioactive particles and waves can kill any living cell by damaging its DNA, so there was a lot of potential for its use in medicine. The field of radiotherapy was kick-started in 1895, when Willem Röntgen discovered X-rays, and the very next year, a few doctors reported that they were able to use X-rays to shrink the tumours of their patients. 
as early as 1901, a doctor from Chicago was quoted as saying, I believe this treatment is an absolute cure for all forms of cancer. I don't know what its limitations are. So doctors experimented on the effectiveness of x-rays over the next 20 years and tested them on not only cancers, but also on infections and inflammatory diseases. It would actually be radioactive elements like radium that would be the mainstay of radiotherapy, as it could be applied to a patient's body much more precisely than x-rays. Radiotherapy was refined even further by Henri Coutard in the early 1930s, whose method of dosing is still in use today. His patients were given multiple smaller doses of radiation, which was spread over a few days or weeks, and it not only reduced his cure rates, but also killed less of the body's normal cells. So the cancer treatment of most patients up to World War II was radiotherapy combined with surgery, but there was still no way to treat metastatic or systemic cancers. Radiotherapy also had many unacceptable side effects, sometimes even causing new cancers to develop. And quite tragically, many of the earliest pioneers of radiotherapy would eventually die as a result of radiation exposure from the experiments. The doctor fighting cancer today has three principal weapons. Surgery, radiotherapy, and treatment by drugs, or chemotherapy. A doctor working in Germany believed that someday, we would invent drugs that could cure a disease and cause little harm to the patient while doing so. Ehrlich called these drugs magic bullets and he coined the term chemotherapy. He was a pioneer in the field of antibiotics and his work would inspire doctors from other fields of medicine to search for their own magic bullets. Cancer chemotherapy was actually launched by a chemical weapon that was used in World War I called mustard gas, because soldiers exposed to it were noticed to have destroyed nearly all of the white blood cells. Nitrogen mustard chemicals were then tested on lymphoma patients during World War II, and it was found to reduce the size and symptoms of the tumours. But the first true cure for cancer was discovered by Dr. Sidney Farber in 1947, who was treating children suffering from leukemia in Boston. Before 1947, acute lymphocytic leukemia killed a child within weeks, but Farber gave them a drug called aminopterin, which caused a complete remission in the majority of his children. The results of this treatment revitalised hopes of a cancer cure and a whole range of chemotherapy treatments came into the market in the decades following this, which all works by damaging the DNA of cancer cells in one way or another. Nitrogen mustards were alkylating agents, aminopterin inhibited folic acid and other drugs use other mechanisms to kill cancer cells. This golden age of cancer drug development peaked in 1965 with combination chemotherapy regimens where drugs from different classes were given at the same time to treat cancer which increased the chance that a cancer would go into remission and now forms the basis of chemotherapy to this day. But chemotherapy wouldn't be the magic bullet to cancer that we hoped for and in developed countries Mortality rates per capita from cancer continued to increase, which was most likely driven by the aging population. Chemotherapy just like radiotherapy was also very non-specific, as it killed normal cells too. The side effects of the combined treatment of surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy were often just as bad as the disease itself. So it was quite clear that the battle against cancer was only just beginning. We are here today for the purpose of signing the 
Cancer Act of 1971. And I hope that in the years ahead that we may look back on this day and this action as being the most significant action taken during this administration. The American government declared a war on cancer in 1971 with the belief that since more money and resources took us to the moon and developed atomic bombs, the same could be done to cure cancer. The money seemed to be going to good use initially as we began to understand the molecular mechanisms of cancer and through the 70s, we discovered the exact mutations that caused cancer to develop. We found several oncogenes genes and tumor suppressor genes and we used them to make detailed genetic pathways to demonstrate how a cancer could form and in the 90s, we were able to use one of these pathways to find the first ever targeted therapy for cancer. 10% of leukemia cases are caused by chronic myeloid leukemia. It's caused by a mutation where parts of chromosomes 9 and 22 switch places which results in the formation of a very powerful oncogene that causes CML and kills patients within 4 years on average. But a drug called imatinib was developed in 1992 which directly blocks the protein encoded by the new gene. The first patients to receive the drug showed a remarkable recovery with virtually no side effects and patients with CML now have a similar life expectancy to the general population. So there we have it, our first ever magic bullet. We found a drug that when given, cured cancer without harming the body. The same methods used to develop imatinib was repeated over the next few years for other types of cancer. And we now have targeted drugs and antibodies for things like metastatic breast cancers, melanomas and several blood cancers. And thanks to these new drugs, cancer mortality rates has drastically reduced from the end of the 20th century to the present day. So why don't we have a cure for all cancers yet? Well, each cancer drug takes well over a decade and around a billion dollars to develop, so we need more time and money. And unfortunately, cancer cells can evolve and mutate even further, giving them resistance to our targeted therapies. But targeted therapy is by no means the end of cancer treatments. Other therapies and research include gene editing therapy, or oncolytic viruses. We're also looking to develop drugs that can target any of the hallmarks of cancer, a concept introduced in the year 2000, which neatly summarises the entirety of human cancer knowledge to this day. Alongside the research on the new cancer treatments, the older methods like surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy are also improving in quality and still successfully improves cancer survival to this day. So we can all be reassured that even though we don't yet have a cure for all cancers, we're getting the best possible treatments, which are backed by over a century of evidence. And sometimes, the best possible is good enough. <laughs>